Okay, so Norman Newton, this is our third lesson on Macbeth close analysis of scenes. Um, and we're looking at Act 5, Scene 5. Essentially, this is where Macbeth finds out about the death of Lady Macbeth that we looked at um, in our last lesson. So, in today's lesson, you will need to open up the Word version or PDF of Act 5, Scene 5. Um, either print it off and annotate it by hand. You could annotate on your screens. Again, you can use the comment section um, in review in Word to add those annotations and it'll come up as a list, which makes some sense. Um, or you could handwrite your annotations on separate sheets of paper um, to be added at a later date. Um, so where are we in the play? Um, if you follow the last two lessons, you'll know that Malcolm's army are almost upon the castle now, ready to lay siege to Macbeth. Um, Macbeth is kind of coming to the realisation that he's being tricked by the witches and by Satan. Um, Satan, look at the spelling, so it's a little bit different, but we'll have a talk about it. A servant, um, a messenger, comes to tell of Lady Macbeth's demise. Um, and finally, we see then in this scene, Macbeth resolves to fight and shows some courage. Um, the old Macbeth comes in. So really, at this point in the play, ultimately, the prophecies that have been given and that Macbeth has acted upon are converging. He still feels um, as if he's invincible because, of course, he's been told that don't worry until Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane, and obviously woods can't move, trees don't move, so he thinks he's invincible. And also, he doesn't have to worry about any man because um, he only has to fear a man who wasn't born of a woman. Um, and we know coming up is the kind of truth of that. And I said in that first lesson. Really, the interesting thing about dealing with futures and prophecies and why perhaps Shakespeare saying you shouldn't rely on these things, this soothsaying, and, um, is because it's never enough information to go upon. It does influence your decisions. For instance, if someone said to me, uh, at 10 a.m. this morning, I'm going to die, um, it might make me not drive home in the car, so I think, oh, okay, I won't go in the car, I'll walk, and then I get the left. Um, you can't go on that information. I'd actually need to know exactly how to avoid it, I guess. Um, and that's really the crux of the play, isn't it? That's the main idea of what's going on here. Trust to yourself, trust to your own actions, trust to the goodness of your actions, and you turn out okay. Um, if you trust to vague prophecies and vague futures, then you're in trouble. Um, although I guess that kind of doesn't necessarily work out. Banco didn't do anything wrong, did it? He just had the wrong friend. Um, so yeah, that's where we are in the play. We're, we're essentially right at the end. Um, as you read along, I'm going to give you a reading, and this time I can use the Scottish accent where possible. Again, I'm really sorry about that, um, especially Rosie Burns in my class, who I know has Scottish heritage. It's not, I'm not trying to take Mickey, it's just all I can manage. Um, I want you to think about how we feel about Lady Macbeth and Macbeth together. Um, this is, as I've said, where we find out that she dies. Not much is made of it, to be honest. Um, we don't know how, you just hear a scream. So why might that be? How does Shakespeare want us to feel for Macbeth at this point? I would say mostly in this play, we're meant to dislike him, but maybe here we feel a sense of pity. Um, how does Shakespeare suddenly show the old Macbeth coming through? What makes that change happen? And why does Shakespeare want us to feel the way he does? Um, so how do we feel, but why does Shakespeare want us to? Those are two different kind of distinct questions. So read along while I read. So at five, Dunsonin within the castle, enter Macbeth, Satan, and soldiers with drums and colors. So this is the beginning of knowing that battle is upon them. Hang out our banners on the outward walls, the cry is still, they come. Our castle's strength will laugh a siege to scorn. 
Yeah, let them lie till famine and ague eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them deaf or beard to beard and beat them backward home. What's that noise? It's the cry of a woman, my good lord. I've almost forgot the taste of fears. The time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek and my fell of hair would at a dismal treaties rouse and stir as life were in it. I've supped full with horrors. Dianus, familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot once start me. Wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle. I but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Thou comest to use thy tongue, thy story quickly. Gracious my lord, I should report, which I say I saw, but know not how to do it. Well, say, sir. As I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked toward Burnham and anon me thought the wood began to move. Why, I'm slave! Let me endure your wrath if it be not so. Within this three mile may you see it coming. I say, a moving grove. If thou speakest false, upon the next tree that shalt thou hang alive, till famine cling thee. If thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou dost for me as much. I pull in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not till Burnham Wood do come to Dunsinane. And now a word comes towards Dunsinane. Arm, arm, and out! If this wood she avouches does appear, there is no flying hence nor tarrying here. I begin to be a weary of the sun and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rack. At least we'll die with harness on our back. So, those are finally the two sides of Macbeth highlighted in one kind of continuous speech with interspersions by other characters. Old Macbeth and New Macbeth, or Beth and Albert Beth, depending on which way you want to look at it. So, again, we're looking at assessment objective one, overall meaning, assessment objective two, the techniques and how they're linked to meaning. Really, it's extended metaphors um, to explain the feelings of the scene. So, everybody comes in, this is like the call to arms, and Macbeth is saying, look, we're not, we don't have to worry. They're not going to be able to beat us here. Hang out our banners on the outer walls. The cry is still they come. Our castle strength will laugh a siege to scorn. So, in the term laugh a siege to scorn, well, the castle can't laugh, can it? So, the castle is personified. Um, what's the point in this personification? Well, it's almost like the castle is part of the army, which, of course, it is. It's defensive. Um, and essentially, Macbeth's like, well, if we stay in here, they can't do anything. They will end up dying on our walls. Here, let them lie till famine and the ague eat them up. So, famine, they'll run out of food. And the ague uh, looks a bit like a certain word that we put very current, isn't it? Plague. All right, so essentially disease. Um, and those diseases, there's some lovely ones. Dysentery, which uh, 
they called the rude word for pooing, they called it the pooing disease. And literally, you would die from diarrhea. Um, equally, you would have numerous other horrible things going around at the time, pox and such and like. Um, and he says to his soldiers, because he kind of he knows that that's a little bit, in a sense, cowardly. He says, were they not forced with those that should be ours? So essentially saying, if they didn't have a huge army with all the people who've left me, we might have met them death or beard to beard. So saying we would have gone out and fought them face to face and beat them backward home. Um, but all my soldiers left me. The ones who were still there are kind of stuck there because what happens in the castle wall shut, nobody's in or out. Um, so they can't flee anymore. And then for all this fight and talk, you get the sudden cry of women within. What's that noise? The cry of women, good Lord. And Beth really says to us here, what has happened to his character over the course of the play? Um, he's saying, I've almost forgot the taste of fears. Can't have a taste of fears, can you? So a metaphor. Essentially, I don't know what it is to be scared anymore. He said, there would have been a time my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek. Okay, so I would have lost. I would have gone pale and felt sick, like he did right at the beginning with the dagger before him, with Banquo's ghost, all of that stuff. And my fell of hair would have a dismal treaties rouse and stir. So it's saying the hair would have gone up on my neck and on my arms. Um, but I have supped full with horrors. Again, this metaphor, I've eaten, I've imbibed, nice word. Horrors, dianus, familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot one start me. So actions that happen that are similar to what I've done, don't scare me anymore, because I've done these awful things. I've killed a king, I've killed my best friend, I've killed women and children, I've had them slaughtered. Um, and he's done all of those things as well on the battlefield beforehand. And the interesting thing, of course, is that on the battlefield, um, and we talk about PTSD from these awful things that he would have seen, they did have an impact on him um, when he was still a good person. It's only when his deeds have been evil that it has ruined his soul. So it's kind of talking about that justification of, of armies killing, that that isn't murder, um, which we're in the modern world coming to some, at least some discussion about the thought of, you know, is it okay ever to kill someone? Um, and here it's really that when he was doing good deeds, when he was fighting for just causes, that was fine. However, as soon as he starts doing it for his own end, that's when his soul begins to rupture. Um, so I can't be scared anymore. It's the type of thing that would have shocked me. And Satan comes in. Now, you'll notice that he's called Satan, S-E-Y. Now, what happened? It's difficult to work out why that might be. I think essentially it it is for the idea that he that the devil is behind things. Um, devil is in the detail. The idea that it's not him who's directed Macbeth; it's the witches. But potentially there's this idea that. Um, goes on finally comes from a character called Satan. The outcome of all of his actions is Lady Macbeth's death. And he does love Lady Macbeth truly and, and fully. And so the knowledge of her death kind of crushes him for a second. And it's almost as if that might be Satan's ultimate end to get not only Macbeth's soul, but to really to torture him. Um, equally it could just be Shakespeare being a bit funny and trying to have a bit of a play on words and so on. Um, I think there is the potential for that discussion, that the information, the way it's given, the Queen, my Lord, is dead. Um, that sort of...
spraying it and shocking. No fluffing it up with nice words and fear of what the outcome will be, like Ross with uh, McDuff. And so again, we have uh, another um, comparison to make between McDuff and Macbeth. So when it talks of Beware McDuff, we know that their kind of characters are intertwined. They are somewhat of a foil for each other. Macduff is right and true in all that he does in his revenge, he is also justified. Macbeth, the opposite. And it cost them both their most dear, precious loved ones. Um, so it's interesting that Macbeth is having to deal with it. And we'll see the difference in the way he reacts. Um, Macduff obviously was open about his sorrow, um, whereas Macbeth, it, it kind of, it does go into it a bit like Malcolm said was unmanly grief. Um, this idea that it's going to break his heart. And he almost gives up. It's only for something to rouse him, but he doesn't. The Queen, my lord, is dead. But that she should have died hereafter, i.e. not now. She should have died later, after me. There would have been a time for such a word. Okay? So there would have been time for such a word. For sorrow and grief. Um, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. She's basically saying for day and days and days would have gone on forever, this grief. It creeps in this petty pace from day to day. The last syllable of recorded time. So it's basically saying that the world has lost all meaning for him with her, her demise. The world has lost um, and he begins to feel weary. He's weary of his actions. He's weary of the role that he um, is part of, the role of, of tyrant and dictator. Um, he's certainly weary of how he's treated people potentially. And I think that, that question I said, why, why does Shakespeare want us to feel potentially sorry for him is again that idea that this was a once good man it's sad to see someone who falls to such a low as he has who who acts in the way that he has it's sad to see um, the demise of someone who was a was was yeah a, a, a courageous man um, so Macbeth goes on and says, all our yesterdays of lighting falls the way to dusty death. Uh, obviously, dusty, the idea of dust to dust, ashes to ashes, so this is the funeral rites. Um, and everything, all our yesterdays, all our history, everything has made our time together almost like idiots. Out, out, brief candle. So again, she was the light in his world. Uh, interesting, of course, taper. She always wanted light around her. He's saying she was the light, and yet it's arguable that she's kind of the darkness, isn't she? She's the one who manipulated him, coerced him into those early actions. So he's still not not necessarily fully aware of his um, how easy he's been to manipulate. Um, equally, he shows his, yeah, certainly a sense of being naive um, and that he hasn't realised exactly what's happened. But he is starting to understand how weary everything is in the world. Life is but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts a player not in the modern sense, okay? A poor player, a bad actor that struts and frets his hour up on the stage. So don't forget that at the time, there were no microphones and things like that. You would have had an actor who's having to really bellow the lines. And this is again that um, classic Shakespeare of 
using metaphors about the stage and about theatre and about actors to inhabit the characters that he's also putting on stage, the meta-textual stuff, that idea of the play within a play, or that reference to breaking the fourth wall. Um, so really that's going on, he's saying, you know, we're like bad actors here on Earth, in our lives, we're, we're no good at what we do. Um, and we heard of no more. It's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So essentially, if you think about classic 80s action films, which are full of sound and fury, but don't really have any meaning, that's what's going on. Now, obviously, Shakespeare didn't know about how much Schwarzenegger said, so don't write that in an essay. Um, but the point being is that everything's pointless. The world is, there's nothing left for me here. It signifies nothing. What's the point? And it's almost as if Macbeth is contemplating suicide, which would be the final scene for him, of course. Uh, suicide being one of the top ten don't do's. Um, and yet we've got a messenger who comes in, and it's this is the switch between sadness and guilt and grief and remorse and loss and all of those things to old Hamlet at Hamlet and about old Macbeth coming back to the fore. Basically, instead of listening to others, his wife is gone, instead of listening to the witches, they're not around and prophecies, he decides that he's going to trust to the thing that had originally at the beginning of the play guided him true and that is to be a warrior thou comest use thy tongue thy story quickly so he's saying to the messenger look come on what have you got to say messenger again this is macbeth he knows that he'll do anything he's like how am i going to tell him the news that i have to tell him gracious my lord i should report that which i say i saw but know not how to do it i don't know how to tell you what i've just seen well say sir Okay, as I did stand, my watch upon the hills, so looking out, seeing if anyone's coming, I looked towards Berman, and anon me thought the wood began to move. Now we know from those who've been reading in the whole play is that the army have cut down boughs of a tree in Burnham Wood and used that to kind of camouflage and mask their movements. But to the messenger, and obviously to Macbeth, this is fulfilling that prophecy of Burnham Wood comes to Dunsinane. Now, it shows you, again, uh, the mistaking of small bits of information. He thought the whole tree would have to come, but obviously that's not the case. So, Macbeth, obviously, at this point, he's invulnerable. Suddenly, you are invulnerable unless the, the wood comes. He can't believe it. Liar and slave. But the messenger's saying, look, uh, if it's not true, then you can do what you want with me, but I'm telling you, it's happening. If thou speakest false upon the next tree, shalt thou hang alive till fanning cling thee. So it's saying, I'm going to kill you. Um, but if thy, tree, thy speech be sooth, then you might as well do the same to me. Because he knows that he's vulnerable. And then that switch, as I said, this thing that pulls him out of all of the actions of the previous five acts, um, it is war. And it's interesting that Shakespeare is saying that, that the thing that makes him good is killing, but in for the right cause. And now, obviously, we know that he shouldn't really be in there. We know he's going to have to die goodness is going to come back. But we certainly feel admiration for the way he finally is willing to meet his demise. I pull in resolution. So I've decided what to do. That's it. Suddenly, instead of all the fears and worries that, and questions that he's asked himself and pangs of guilt that have happened, I'm ready. And begin to doubt the equivocation of the theme that lies like truth. Fear not till burning wood does come to Dunsinane. So, he's questioning 
prophecies. He realizes that he's been tricked, that he's been dumped. And now a word comes towards Dunsany. Arm, arm and out! So, instead of staying inside, and if he had, don't forget that they probably would have been fine, it's enraged him and he can't take it anymore and he needs to go to battle. If this which he avouches does appear, so if this what the messenger said actually is happening, there is no flying hence nor tarrying here. We're not going to leave, we're not going to wait here. I begin to be a weary of the sun, so I'm ready for it. I'm ready for my fate. And finally, and that's kind of what, again, Shakespeare wants, isn't it? He wants you to accept what, I guess it's not really what he wants. It's he is making reference to the belief of the time that your fate is your fate, whatever happens, and you should relent to it. Now, fate and the other of God don't necessarily go hand in hand. Um, Christians would believe that God has given us the choice to make choices. It's why evil things happen. It's why when people say, oh, why does God let famine happen? Or it's why Macduff says, why didn't the Almighty take part, take, you know, go and protect my wife and children? It's because we're in charge of our own decisions and our own future. It's why we have to decide to live a good life and so on, to attain heaven. And yet, certainly at the time, they also believe that fate and your stars and if you are born under a bad sign, so literally under the wrong star sign or in a certain way, this would impact how you lived your life and your luck and your circumstances and everything. Um, and the idea that you shouldn't climb above your station. Now, Shakespeare is a social climber. He comes from a well-off family, but nothing special, and becomes, you know, a, a very well-respected in his time um, author, though he wouldn't have ever guessed the extent to which he is now regarded. Um, and it's because he's talking about universal impacts on us and um, truth to our life. He's, you can view this from the Elizabethan point of view, but from our point of view as well. In Macbeth, we have a man who's done wrong who tries to change that. And in Macbeth, we have a character who we might definitely start to feel pity for. So he decides then... There's nothing we can do here. I begin to be a weary of the sun and wish the estate of the world would now under. So I don't want to be part of this anymore. The estate, the titles, the land, the way of the world was different. Ring the alarm bell, blow wind, come rack. So to be put on the rack, the torture device of medieval um, and Elizabethan times, at least we'll die with harness on our back. So finally, he has a, a cause to fight for. He's decided he's not going to just follow what he's been told blindly anymore. And it's too late. We know that, but it's part of that, the tragedy of it. So your final plan and your final practice question is how does Shakespeare portray Macbeth's thoughts and feelings in this extract, make reference to all the characters? Well, when you talk about Satan, you're saying, well, he doesn't really say much. But you can talk about the meaning behind it and the potential meanings. Because, of course, it doesn't just have to be one thing, does it? As I said, it could be that he's portraying Satan as the last little thing that is um, pushing and showing Macbeth the idiocy of what he's done. Equally, you can just to be a play on words, and he's there just stating facts. Um, you work out the key parts of the question, you have three to four main points, one for each paragraph, and each paragraph needs to have three quotes, and you need to cover the whole extract. So when you're looking for them, you go through the whole thing. Um, I thought that your extract headings, uh, sorry, paragraph headings could be pain and sorrow, so, uh, Macbeth, about Lady Macbeth and about the life, doubt and fear, that idea that he doesn't really do that anymore, he suddenly becomes resolute, he says there was a time when I would have been shot, I'm not anymore, resignation and resolution, I become a weary of the sun, and courage, I think potentially there's a question mark there, but he is showing courage, he's finally decided to do something, which is perhaps more than he has done in the rest of the play. So that's going to take you the rest of the lesson. You don't need to write your response. Um, 
but if you want to, you can. And if you really, really wanted to go above and beyond, you could email me that work. Now, again, as with all of these um, these lessons, if you have any questions about them specifically, email me, even if I'm not your teacher. Um, and that's it. Thank you for your patience. That's all, folks.